Jungle Deep, 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 the podcast that explores the tropical lifestyle. Hello, and welcome to the podcast, Jungle Deep. This is your host, Dr. Jones. We are on safari, and I'm here with you to learn, to have fun, and to explore the jungle. Welcome to today's show. We have two guest segments today. First, we have the return of our field correspondent with a report on jungle food and drink, Kelly Patterson. And her topic today is bananas. And I don't mean it's crazy. I mean it really is about bananas. Then, after the break, we are visited by the senior keeper and global ambassador for the San Diego Zoo, San Diego Zoo Safari Park, and the San Diego Global Wildlife Conservancy. His name is Rick Schwartz. And this time, Rick will talk to us about the history and organization of the San Diego Zoo. Then we discuss rainforest conservation and how individual efforts like recycling aluminum cans can help to save areas of rainforest. Let's go now to hear from our exclusive exotic food and drink field correspondent, Kelly, about bananas. Well, I have with us now our field correspondent for food and drinks, Kelly Patterson. Welcome to the show, Kelly. Thank you. And what do you have for us today? I have banana fun facts. Oh, bananas. Great. I like bananas. Everybody loves bananas, and it (laughs) turns out bananas are the most consumed fruit in the United States. Wow. You mean more than than anything else? Apples, strawberries, grapes, uh, oranges, the most consumed fruit in the United States. That's awesome. It is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Per capita consumption, 27 pounds per person annually. Wow. So I must eat about 27 pounds, huh, in a year? <laughs> well, if you if you eat less than that, then that means someone's eating more. Yeah, well, that's a lot of bananas. That's a lot of bananas. Well, what else can you tell us about bananas? They're the fourth largest agricultural product worldwide after wheat, rice, and corn. You're kidding. And over 100 billion are consumed throughout the world per year. Whoa, I had no idea. The fourth largest agricultural product in the whole world? Yes, yes. Wow, wow. I knew bananas were kind of popular, but I had no idea they were that big in agriculture. That's amazing. (laughs) My word, where are all those bananas coming from? Um, The bananas we eat, they tend to come from countries like Ecuador, the Philippines, Costa Rica, Honduras, Guatemala, and Panama, but the tropics. India actually grows the most bananas, but they're mainly consumed there domestically in India. So even though they're the largest banana grower, we don't get those bananas. Ah, so they're popular in India. Oh, yeah. Well, figures, are, as I understand it, they're popular all over the world and have been for a long, long time. Farming of bananas goes back something like eight to 10,000 years. Oh, yeah, yeah. Isn't that amazing? Absolutely, yeah. So they've been around the world for a long time and uh, very popular for a long time. Yeah, they really have. Well, are there more than one kind of banana? Yeah, there are. Um, the, the bananas that we know are the Cavendish variety. Those are the ones that we see in the supermarket. Those are known as sweet bananas. And those are the ones that, you know, you can buy and peel it and just eat it. 
Um, plantains are also a type of banana that we would see in the supermarket, but those are known as cooking bananas since they're not sweet and you're not going to eat that without cooking it. You know, I'm not sure if I've ever had a plantain, but I've always been curious about that. Wanted to learn how to cook them and serve them. Um, and they, I yeah, guess, good. I guess we consume a fair amount of those because they're in the grocery stores. And I understand there's. Did you say there was over a uh-huh. hundred uh, species of bananas? Yeah, I've seen there've been over 150 species of bananas, just, and not all yellow. I mean, I heard about one that was like pink and white. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a purple one, yeah. Apparently, in nature, occurs in a lot of different shapes and sizes. Some of them are no bigger than your little finger, and others are, are of course, as big as we're familiar with. And they come in all kinds of colors and sizes and character as well. Um, you know, some have, uh, a lot of bananas have very big seeds, and, of course, the bananas we eat have, uh, the seeds are almost almost invisible. They're very, very right. small, inconsequential. It's actually a berry. I didn't know if you... <laughs> The banana is an herb, and uh-huh. and then the actual bananas themselves are a berry. Considered a berry, uh-huh. scientifically speaking. Hmm. Yeah. And I guess that's one of the reasons the Cavendish was chosen to market, but I, I understand also it, it's not the best-tasting banana. Uh, first of all, Cavendishes, if you let them ripen on the tree, taste a lot better ripe off the tree. They don't last but a few days that way. They can't harvest them and ship them around the world ripe because they just don't have enough time. Right, yeah, they have to harvest them while they're still green, you know, in the Transport. And then they, they export them, and that way they have a shelf life of a few weeks. And I understand they actually gas them. Once they get them to a country, they put them in a chamber and expose them to a gas that ripens them before that's they right. send them out to the local stores. I guess that's harmless, and I guess that works. But uh, the fact is, in nature, there's a whole lot more bananas that are better tasting than the ones we're so used to. <laughs> I've heard that. I, I have to, I've only had the Cavendish and the plain thing, but... Yeah, I, I'd love to go to the tropics and, and and explore that and find out about, you know, some of the other recommended banana species. And I hear that this one, the Cavendish, is on its way out. Actually, the Cavendish bananas that we eat are really clones of the first Cavendish. It makes them very susceptible to disease. So, you know, a really good you know, disease will wipe them out. And they're grown as a monoculture in a lot of places, of course, in the tropics around the world, and they have these giant farms of banana trees. And, like, the problem that so happens, so often happens with monocultures, if if a disease gets going, it spreads like fire and can be disastrous. And, in fact, they expect that these Cavendishes that have been propagated all over the world, we, we could lose them in 10 to 20 years. Uh, they just will lose their viability because genetically they have no diversity that would give them the resistance that they, they should have and would otherwise have in nature. So an, another drawback of monoculture. Right. Well, that's amazing. Can you imagine if all the bananas started disappearing or they got, you know, because they were getting scarce, they got really, really expensive and, and they weren't a part of our regular lives anymore, that people would notice that, wouldn't they? And clearly, because this is such a popular fruit. Yeah. Wow. From my point of view, I guess I just would want to point out to our listeners that you just can't produce that much of, of a product, of an agricultural product, of a something like, like a banana. You can't produce that much out of the tropics around the world to an ever-growing population and not have it cause uh, disastrous effects upon the rainforest. I, I don't know how much rainforest destruction is attributable to the agriculture of bananas, but uh, you can bet it's an awful lot and it's just going to get worse. I mean, you know, what can you do? <laughs> I, uh, we, we've got to have more sustainable ways of, of growing these kinds of crops and that don't uh, destroy the natural environment of the rainforest. So uh, banana farming is something to keep an eye on. That's a major, the fourth largest crop in the world. And uh, the other ones are corn, rice, and wheat, is it? Yes. The grains? Is that, uh, well, so this is the only, this is the biggest one that comes from the tropics. So it's uh, it's something I want to learn more about, and I invite our listeners to learn more about these uh, these bananas and how they're produced, because obviously it has a it's got to be having a major impact on the rainforest of the world. And when we get a some a tropical rainforest expert on the show, and I've invited a couple, when we get them on, that's that's something I'm going to ask them about. Yeah, I've heard of other 
other crops also being problems. We talked last time about chocolate and a tremendous amount of cacao beans are produced off of these cacao trees from again they have to come exclusively from tropical areas but I don't think they have to be produced in a monoculture way and in fact that industry is responding and trying to change to a more sust sustainable way of producing that crop but bananas uh, boy that's this is something to keep an eye on do you have any more background information to give us or are we going to go straight to the fun part it takes up to nine months to grow bananas. a banana tree or the banana fruit it's I guess it must be the fruit itself yeah yeah, yeah. And, and and you know it takes them you know it takes time to ship them you know I, like we said they're harvested while they're still green and then transported to market and moved to ripening rooms so it, it really is quite a production to get a banana uh -huh. to the supermarket and they're of course very good for you they're healthy aren't they they're naturally fat cholesterol and sodium free and a good source of potassium, dietary fiber, manganese, and vitamin C and B6. Hmm. I wouldn't have thought of vitamin C in a banana. You know, I always think of oranges. No, I wouldn't but... eat <laughs> Well, that's good. <laughs> I wouldn't eat either. And they also contain tryptophan, which, as you may know, is an amino acid, which is said to help your body produce serotonin. So bananas may actually act as a gentle sedative. Hmm, I should give more bananas to my kids then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take it down a notch, slow them down. <laughs> when they get hyper, I'll just call them banana deficient. <laughs> <laughs> you, you said Elvis was known for, he had some kind of a, a relationship with bananas. What was that? Oh, he's a banana party. Well, you know, he's famous for the fried peanut butter and banana sandwiches. Oh, yeah, I guess that's and true. And also yeah. banana pudding. But, so, yes, Elvis... Um, like his bananas in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. And you have a way for us to enjoy bananas today. What is that? Yes, this is actually a cookie recipe that's just downright healthy. Huh. And, healthy and, cookies. Yeah. Let's have more of those. <laughs> Believe it or not. <laughs> and, and a banana cookie, that sounds... Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I've ever had a banana cookie. It sounds intriguing and sounds good. Tell us a little bit about it. How do we and, do this? Oh, yes. Yeah, so, so easy to make. Preheat the oven to 350 degrees. And then combine three cups of mashed banana, two cups of oats, one quarter cup vegetable oil, one teaspoon vanilla, and one half cup dried cranberries or any dried fruit that you like, and one half teaspoon ground ginger. Mix all that up and just let the batter sit for 15 minutes. Then drop by rounded teaspoonfuls onto an ungreased cookie sheet and bake for 12 minutes or until they start to brown. But just you know, check them after 12 minutes. And that's really all there is to it. So easy. Sounds good. And look at the ingredients. It is That looks really healthy, too. That's i gotta, I got to try that. Now, we're going to have this recipe up on our show notes page for this episode, so you can uh, you can get it there, too. And i uh, got to give that a try. I Gosh, I wish I'd known about this earlier i would have been raising my kids on <laughs> banana cookies and ha and had them behaving properly too <laughs> <laughs> right. well you also you have something for us to drink with our banana cookies what <laughs> i do this is a little more of a grown-up banana treat uh -huh. um, something you're known for uh, <laughs> yes yes uh, it wouldn't be one of my recipes without a cocktail um, but yes, I like to call this one monkey milk, <laughs> and you make this in the blender. Uh -huh. So combine in a blender one cup of crushed ice, two ounces light rum, one ounce coffee liqueur such as Kahlua, one half cup coconut milk, one banana, and a dash of chocolate bitters, and just blend it until smooth mm. and pour into a glass. Mm. Really good. That sounds good. It's, I bet it is good. But see, I, I wouldn't have thought of a banana a banana cocktail. <laughs> well, that's why we have you here. You're amazing. You've done it again. You hit right. it out of the park, another home run. A great dessert and uh, a great cocktail, and it's all based on our tropical fruit of the episode, bananas. And I invite everyone to check out your show. What Tell us, what is your, your regular online TV show called? The Teen Lounge Kitchen, and that's Kitch, K I T S C H dash E N dot com, right? And we can be found at www dot 
Velveteen Lounge Kitchen. Com. Right. Great. Thank you for joining us uh, this week with all this interesting information about bananas and the recipes. This is going to be fun. Thank you very much for joining us here on Jungle Deep. Thank we'll you. We'll talk to you again next time. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Bye. You are listening to Jungle Deep. 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 This is Kelly Camille Patterson of the Velveteen Lounge Kitchen, and I make my lime fellow marshmallow cottage cheese surprise while listening to Jungle Deep. Hi, I'm Al Bowl, film producer of Tarzan, Lord of Louisiana Jungle, and I clean my lenses while listening to Jungle Deep. Aloha, this is Marty Lush from the Tikiaki Orchestra, and when I'm not vibing with the band, I'm listening to the vibes of Ken Jones and Jungle Deep. Hi, this is your host, Ken Jones, from the Prince of Ponds podcast. The frogs are shaking the shakers, the turtles are hitting the slapsticks, and the koi are blowing the trumpets. It's party time at the Prince of Ponds. Out under the swaying palm trees, the pond fairies are kicking up their heels, spinning in delight in the twilight. It's time to celebrate the magic of ponds, waterfalls, fountains, and water gardens at the Prince of Ponds podcast. This is Dr. Jones. I invite you to visit a website to learn about a tribute underway for one of the world's most beautiful natural places, Yosemite National Park. Masters of their craft, the Polsons are creating one-of-a-kind gorgeous murals of stained glass representing the four seasons of Yosemite. Their project is a limited campaign at kickstarter.com for only 30 days from October 19th to November 17th, 2012. During this special 30-day period, you can take part in this historic art project and participate in the creation of this awesome exhibit honoring Yosemite. If you love Yosemite, then you'll love the four seasons of Yosemite. Learn more at kickstarter.com. That's kickstarter, K-I-C-K-S-T-A-R-T-E-R dot com, and search for four seasons of Yosemite. Now, more of Jungle Deep Deep Deep. Our second interview today is with Rick Schwartz. Rick is a senior animal keeper and also serves as the San Diego Zoo Global Ambassador, representing the San Diego Zoo, the San Diego Zoo Safari Park, and San Diego Zoo Global Wildlife Conservancy. He joined the San Diego Zoo in the year 2000 and so has been with the zoo for about 12 years now. In his role as ambassador, Schwartz has traveled across the country and around the world and has been featured in such national television programs as The Today Show and The Early Show while discussing the zoo's conservation programs. And now, Rick is with us on Jungle Deep. Today I'm really pleased to have a zoo ambassador from the great San Diego Zoo, Rick Schwartz. Uh, Hello, Rick. Welcome to the program. How do you? How are you? I am fine, and I'm really pleased to have you join us because I've been wanting to get an update on the great San Diego Zoo. And I say great because I think most people are aware that, well, you know, think of the zoo as being rather famous. It's it's had a reputation for a long time for being the world's largest zoo, and yet many of us may not have been there for many years. And I want to know what's happening at the zoo, and uh, perhaps you could give us a little, a little bit of history of the zoo and a, an explanation of, of its organization. But, of course, we want to get to specifically what the San Diego Zoo's involvement is in tropical rainforest conservation and, and preservation of its species. So uh, first, uh, Rick, tell us a little bit about yourself. How, how long have you been at the zoo there? Uh, well, I've been with the uh, San Diego Zoo and, and uh, San Diego Zoo Global, the parent company now for, um, gosh, just about 12 years. Uh, we're about a month shy of 12 years right now. And uh, most of that time as a, uh, a trainer and keeper, and in that position as trainer and keeper, I had the wonderful opportunity to work with animals that we utilize for a lot of our outreach programs and conservation events and school groups, summer schools, things of that nature. So it was a really great position to fall into in the sense that I am very passionate about wildlife and wildlife conservation and the work that we do, but I also enjoy getting that message out to our guests. So. I spent many years not only taking care of the animals hands-on directly and raising a lot of animals, but then having the opportunity to share my experiences and share my knowledge with our guests that they've come through. And then just in the last couple of years, I I was hired into the position as ambassador for the zoo and our sister facility, the Safari Park. It's been a blessing because it really is, it it falls right into what I love doing with my life. And it's one of those positions, one of those jobs where it's a lot of work, it's a lot of hours, but I don't ever feel like I have to work. It's... 
it's exactly what I'd be doing <laughs> if I didn't have this job. You know, it's kind of along the lines of, of your passions with your, your show here and your podcast with wanting to get the message out there, wanting to start that conversation, wanting to find out more. And this job is great. It's my opportunity to travel the world uh, representing the zoo and also going out and working in our conservation uh, efforts that we have around the world, learning more myself about what we do and bringing that information then to everybody else. So as ambassador, you are a spokesperson for the zoo. Do I have that right? Yes, that is part of the job. Part of my job, I, I travel around to different TV shows, bring some of my animals with me to talk about either the programs we're specifically doing at the zoo or the work we're doing around the world or sometimes just to help get people excited and interested about the unique and different animals from around the world. Podcasts like this, radio shows, local television, local community talks, and then the other part of being an ambassador who represents the zoo, and not just with the general public, but then with scientists and other keepers around the world and conservation organizations. Well, it it sounds terrific. It sounds a little bit like what I used to do. And frankly, if you ever need a day off, you keep my phone number handy. <laughs> Fair, enough. Fair enough. I'd love to fill in for you and give you a break. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about the zoo now, the zoo's uh, history. Most of us are familiar a little bit about the San Diego Zoo and its tremendous collection there in San Diego. And then, of course, you're now call your safari park. Tell us about that. Uh, how old is the zoo and how did this growth happen? The zoo itself is closing in on its centennial. It was established in 1916, wow. officially uh, in October of 1916, by Dr. Harry Wegeforth. He was a surgeon here in San Diego. Now, of course, at that time, San Diego proper was no bigger than what we know as downtown San Diego today. And Balboa Park, where the zoo is located, was off out of the city limits as far as uh, many uh, citizens were concerned. Uh, the Panama California Expo had occurred in 1915 there in Balboa Park, and many of the structures and things that were part of this giant expo kind of got abandoned, and that's now become uh, Balboa Park's museum area, which is just phenomenal. If you've never been there, you have to go. It's just a gorgeous area of tons of different museums from every subject you can think of. With mm -hmm. that, then, though, a lot of animals that were part of the expo were just abandoned and left in Balboa Park. At that time, uh, because of the abandonment, there were lions left in cages. Uh, oh, no. Yeah, there, were, well, there was a, a, I read this, of course, there was a, a wild uh, herd of elk. Of course, elk are not native to San Diego and never have been, but they were there for part of the display and then just cut loose into the park. So uh -huh. with that, the lions, of course, in the evening hours and morning hours always roar. It's their location called established territory. Well, so the saying goes, anyhow, it started with a roar. Dr. Harry uh, Wegeforth was driving <laughs> to the park with his brother, and they heard those roars, and they thought to themselves or said out loud to each other, wouldn't it be great if San Diego were to have a zoo? And the cool thing about Dr. Harry Wegeforth is he was always interested in making sure kids had a good time. So for him, the whole idea, and honestly, from what I've read about him, he sounds like a big kid at heart, to be, to be honest with you. He, it was always about making sure the kids of San Diego had the opportunity to learn about the world, always uh, have the kids have an opportunity to get their hands on with animals and get excited about that sort of stuff. And that's really kind of been the ongoing theme for the San Diego Zoo and the foundation of what we do. Interestingly enough, he was very foresighted in conservation. Uh, even as early as the 1920s, his thoughts were, how can we establish something where these animals can live long and, and prosper? And it was then the follow-up director, uh, Dr. Schroeder, in the 60s, who really had the concept that we can no longer take animals from the wild to sustain our zoos. And that was the 1960s, so that was pretty early for that kind of mindset. I mean, he really thought that we need to start breeding animals more successfully here in the United States. And that was where the idea of what we now call the San Diego Zoo Safari Park was born. Now, anybody in the San Diego area or who's traveled through here might remember it more as the Wild Animal Park. It went through a name change recently. But it's still the, the same area, you know, a lot more great adventures and things to, to experience and animals to see. But that was initially established in the late 60s as a, a breeding facility. Dr. Schroeder was told by many people that, you know, that people will never pay to go out there. It's out in the middle of nowhere. It's actually uh, roughly 30-some miles north and to the east of where the zoo is. Again, similar to how the, the zoo was established outside of city limits in Balboa Park. Well, this was then well beyond the city limits. And as a breeding facility, we're talking 1,800 yes. acres. The place is huge. It ended up people were lining up on the little two-lane highway with their binoculars to try and see the animals. <laughs> so they did actually open it to the public in 1972, and it's been open ever since. And so we have both those facilities, the San Diego Zoo, which is near Balboa Park or in Balboa Park, established in 1916, and now our San Diego Zoo Safari Park, established in 1972. Wow. 
Well, now, and that's not the end of it. You have you have the the San Diego Zoo Global is something that might be new to some people, and you have an institute. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. The San Diego Zoo's always had the conservation mindset. Again, established with Dr. Harry Wagenforth and his his successor, Dr. Schroeder. It has always been our goal to make sure that we not only show these animals and get the public excited about coming to see them, but that we take responsibility for their proper care and be a leadership and uh, sort of take a leadership role, if you will, amongst zoos and the animal care community about how to properly care for these animals. And then looking at what's happening with those wild populations, we want to make sure that they continue to thrive and do well. And that really kind of kicked off that conservation mindset and, and goal and direction. So with that, of course, you can't just have conservation by putting animals back out in the wild. You have to study. You have to research. You have to understand the needs of their individual and group needs in their habitats. What does their habitat need to thrive and be healthy? So with that, we employ plenty of scientists and work with many conservation organizations and have our own people out on the ground uh, through our Institute for Conservation Research. And that's the third entity then of San Diego Zoo Global. We have the, the San Diego Zoo, San Diego Zoo Safari Park, and the Institute for Conservation Research. That institute is an actual working scientific building that we utilize to study genetics, to make sure breeding is appropriate, to study what animals are related to whom in the wild or in the zoo population. A lot of work is being done to better understand subspecies of certain animals because when you're looking at conservation, are you accidentally crossbreeding subspecies? Are you saving one subspecies and not the other? And the list goes on and on. And all three of those organizations, again, the zoo, the safari park, and the institute, are under the umbrella of San Diego Zoo Global. And now that said, the Institute has been around for well over 40 years, and San Diego Zoo Global has basically been around also all along. Really, though, we're noticing that the social paradigm here in, in America and around the world, people are becoming more aware of the environment. They're more interested in being green. They want to know how they can help and what's being done. So we are bringing to the forefront, look, we've been doing this all along, and this is what we're doing. If you want to help, you're more than welcome. And there's a lot of ways for people to get involved and help and be a part of our conservation organizations. Uh, and we're letting people know, too, you know, we're, we're located in 35 different countries around the world, on the ground, actually doing conservation work, uh, and working with the local cultures and the local wow. people, and uh, getting scientists on the ground to make sure things are being done properly. Wow, that, well, <laughs> that's very well explained, and, and the scope of this is, is, is pretty amazing. Can, can you give us any numbers to help us picture the size of your organization? Just how, how budget do you folks have to do all this work? To be in 35 countries, that sounds rather expensive. How do you, how do you, how do you handle all this? What, what is your organization like? Well, to start off with, the zoo itself is 100 acres, 125 if you count the parking lot. The safari park itself is 1,800 acres, but we're only using 900 of that. The other half is purposely set aside as a preserve because you may not know this, here in Southern California is the most diverse county in the United States with plant life and animals because of the fact we have coastal, we have hills and mountains, and we have desert. All in one county, it adds up to being the most diverse. And so we purposely set aside 900 really? acres that be non-disturbed, uh, pristine habitat for our local wildlife too, which is very important, not just uh, wildlife from around the world. Well, Rick, 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 did you just say it's the most diverse county in the United States? That is correct. Or in California, in, in the whole country? The whole country. Wow. Yeah, because that is, th there are several things nice to play into that. It's because of the, the actual physical size of San Diego County and the fact that it right. covers several different what we'd call climate it's big. zones, mm -hmm. uh, both coastal, inland, uh, hills, mountains, and desert all fall within one county. And so that creates a, a collection of wildlife and uh, fauna or plants that you don't find that diversity anywhere else in the nation in one county. Well, it makes sense once you point to it, but I just I, I just didn't know that. And that is, yeah, I, that's yeah. pretty remarkable and pretty special. It, is, it really is, yeah. I mean, we're blessed. I'm glad the zoo's honoring that, such, that fact and playing a part with that, too. Oh, yeah. We have many actual conservation programs going on right here in our own county, in our own backyard, uh, whether it's the, the coastal clapper rail, which is a bird species that inhabits our marine coast that's endangered, or our bighorn sheep up in the hills, all the way down to the little uh, you know kangaroo rats and a wide variety of other species. We have active programs that we're currently spearheading or working directly with the companies that are spearheading them. So uh, tell us some more about your, what's your staff like? How many people work for your organization? 
Well, because we do, you know, the, the San Diego Zoo, you know, San Diego Zoo Global, and then all all the entities below us, being the, the zoo and the safari park, we're a nonprofit organization, and that's important to let people know because sometimes you think of these large organizations must be profitable for some reason or another. We're a nonprofit organization, so anything that we make over uh, what our operating costs are goes right back into what we're doing directly, and that allows us to really uh, maximize the income that we have. So. Income generators would be the, the park and the zoo, of course, but really the biggest thing is we're very blessed with a large membership base and those who believe in the work that we do and donate money to us. It's the, and they're going to be all over the world. They I'm are, sorry. exactly. We have donations coming in from all over the world, and we have a lot of people who really feel passionate about the wildlife and, and the conservation work that we do, and they invest heavily in donating to us. And so we're very blessed with the financial support we get from, from others uh, that see that we are making a difference, that maybe they physically themselves can't go out there and do the field work, but they want to support those that do. So as a nonprofit organization, we are very fortunate and blessed with our membership base and our donations, and that really is what keeps us afloat. Well, you obviously have, have a lot of fans. Yes, <laughs> we do, and we're always welcome to gain more fans, that's for sure. You know. It's, well, I, I hope our little podcast might help. Yeah, with that. exactly. It's, it's, gr it's great hearing about all, all all of this. Exactly. And so that's one thing, like I mentioned earlier. You know, we've always been quick to promote the zoo and the safari park and come out and have this experience, have a great time, see animals and wildlife from all over the world. Now it's an opportunity too to share with people what we've been doing beyond the the fence line of our zoo and let them know about that work and help them get involved one way or another, whether it's sharing the knowledge and passion or or being able to donate some time or donate some money a little bit to uh, more in the direction towards the tropical rainforest. It's my perception that the history of zoos in general has been from uh, taking a, a handful of exotic animals and, and just displaying them in cages as novelties to a greater appreciation for the animals and going from cages to habitats. I think zoos have been kind of moving towards creating themes with their habitats and having those those animals in their care actually represent biomes and actual specific environments for different areas of the world. And I, I like an environmental approach to the display of animals. Uh, I think it helps educate people on the context in which the animal lives. It's, it's very important. And we're needing to protect these animals and their environments. And, and if we don't protect their environments, uh, we're, we're going to lose the animals. So what do you have in the way of uh, tropical rainforest exhibits at your at your facilities there at the zoo or at the at safari park? I, it's been my impression Safari Park is really is not a tropical rainforest type exhibit, but I know you do have some at the zoo. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, certainly. You know, the, the first thing to, to really point out is the tropical forest is a broad term, and I want your listeners to understand that we have tropical rainforests all around the world. We actually have a, a, a rainforest, not tropical, but rainforest up in Washington State with some of the old growth forests up there up by Seattle. We have oh, sure. tropical rainforests all throughout Central and South America. We have uh, tropical rainforests throughout Asia, throughout Africa, and Australia. So it, it is really a, so almost if you were to look at a globe, it would be on either side of the equator, almost all the way around, anywhere you find any land, because just the nature of, of that. Now with the zoo and the safari park, we do have a wide variety of tropical rainforest exhibits, and you're spot on, you're exactly correct. The goal is not to just display a tropical animal. We want our guests to be immersed into the environment. What does it look like? What does it smell like? What does it sound like? We don't want just one tropical cat, one desert cat, you know, as you go down the, the road. We want you to be immersed into this area so you see birds and reptiles from that area also. You see perhaps some large and interesting insects. And then, oh, by the way, there's also this gorgeous, beautiful tropical cat that lives there, too, that you're really probably there to look for. But, you know, and so, yeah, you're, you know, we want people to take their time. We want them to, to look at what's going on in the environment and understand it better and really gain an appreciation for the big picture, for how the, the ecosystem needs to balance out properly. I so much more enjoy and appreciate that approach from the old-fashioned reptile house and monkey house and cat park and... I, th I think that uh, day's gone by, and from a practical point of view, I understand it, but I, I mean, not as far as educating the public, the idea of houses for specific types of animals is not as educational and not as enjoyable as environmentally uh, themed uh, presentation of those animals. So can you tell us a little more specifically about what, what you have there at the San Diego Zoo in this way? 
Oh, sure. I mean, we have anywhere from uh, a wide variety of exotic cats, of course, you know, tigers and leopards and jaguars, uh, ocelots, things of that nature when it comes to cats, a wide variety of primate species, reptiles, amphibians, insects, uh, you name it, you know, it, it's probably somewhere on our on our ground somewhere. And it's really exciting that that we have the opportunity to, to have so many people come through our gate and be able to show them and, uh, these animals, get them excited about it. But one thing I definitely want to mention before we run out of time is it's not just about getting people excited about the animals and understanding the need for proper habitat, but so many times we hear, well, geez, you know, I live here in San Diego or I live in Sacramento or I live in, you know, the middle of Iowa. What can I do for a tropical rainforest in Brazil? I, I don't understand how I can help or what I can do in my day-to-day -day life to make a difference. And one of the big things I always tell people, because sometimes we don't see it, it's right in front of us, is the simple act of recycling things like aluminum makes a huge impact in the tropical rainforest. And it's kind of a, a, a long route to get there on how you recycling aluminum can helps the ocelot down in Brazil. But let me explain it. Bauxite is a mineral. It's the base mineral for aluminum. Bauxite is mined in open mines and strip mining. And for those who are not familiar with that, it's not like we see in the movies where they're down in a tunnel uh, chasing an ore of gold or a strand of silver or something like that. Bauxite is more, think about like loose rocks or near the surface of, of the, the earth. So they can't just dig a hole and find a strand of it to start mining. They have to strip mine it. And unfortunately, strip mining is basically thinking of a, a very powerful hose washing away all the topsoil. And it's not just washing away the topsoil, but of course nothing will ever grow there again because the topsoil is gone. You lose a lot of habitat because of that. But then all that water that's washed away, that topsoil, has to go somewhere. And that clouded, dirty, muddy water goes down into the creeks, into the rivers, and makes it very challenging for life to happen properly there in the smaller estuaries, uh, in the rivers. And so the, the domino effect of damage that has occurred is huge. And the strip mining, of course, like I said, once they're done, they've got the bauxite out there to change into aluminum. Uh, they they will move on, and there's no reason for them to try and you know rebuild that area. And it is a dead zone for a very, very long time, and loss of habitat for, for everyone that will rely on that tropical rainforest. It's quite devastating. And so the other side of that is instead of just throwing away aluminum, which will live in the landfill for well over 500 years as aluminum, you can recycle it. And within a few weeks, it can be another can on the shelf for you to have a beverage in, or it can be a part of an aluminum portion of the airplane or vehicle you drive. And that it can be recycled over and over again. It, it is very malleable and very useful tool for us to do that. Not only the energy saving and all that, uh, but it helps minimize the, the damages we see into the tropical rainforest that we all care so much about. So it's a, it's a great opportunity for us in our own day-to-day -day life to simply take that can and put it in the recycling bin instead of throwing it away. And there are so many. You're, you're right, Rick, and I, it's kind of the mission of my podcast is to help people understand and get more clear on how things they can do in their own homes and their own lives really does impact the, the rainforest. And that's because so much of what we use every single day comes from uh, their natural resources that come from the rainforest. And usually the rainforest is paying a price, is being compromised for the pursuit of those resources. I, we just did an interview with our field correspondent, Kelly, who reports on food and drink. She, uh, our last topic which will be up soon on our website uh, she reports on bananas I was surprised to find that banana production is the fourth largest agricultural crop in the country there's corn wheat rice all three grains and then it's bananas and those bananas come from plantations in the tropics coffee production chocolate we had chocolate was another topic we've talked about recently huge amount of chocolate production it's amazing from the cacao beans from these trees that have to grow in the tropics and so there's so many things that it could go on and and we will go on for for months and years with this podcast i'm sure talking about all the different things that we all use that come from the rainforest. So conserving the three R's is really important. And that's one of the basic things we gotta teach people to conserve, reduce, and, and recycle. So that's an important thing. I think the listeners of Jungle Deep are fans and hobbyists having to do with the rainforest as well. So there's there's even more we can do, but I, I think that's such a, an important fundamental thing that, that we can all get probably even more clear about as we get exposed to it. With a couple minutes left here, can you tell us about any programs uh, that you're specifically that you have underway right now, having to do with uh, rainforest conservation or species from the rainforest that uh, 
that you're currently focused on? Is there something specific that maybe we could learn more about? Oh, certainly. You know, uh, I would definitely encourage everyone to go to our website, sandiegozoo.org, and that takes you to the main zoo website. But along the, the top there, there are tabs. One of them says conservation, and that one is constantly being updated with our programs. And that is probably the quickest and easy, easiest way to reference uh, all of our programs around the world. Another tropical rainforest we haven't spoken too much about is over in China, the bamboo forest, both in higher elevations where it's cooler and the tropicals. We're doing work with our pandas and doing work with the Chinese government over there. Uh, we have another program in South America, uh, Cochacachu, near the right off the Amazon, rain, or Amazon uh, River. It's quite literally in the middle of nowhere. It's a wonderful space to actually uh, be able to study pristine habitat that hasn't been disturbed yet, to really get a baseline for what we're looking for in the areas we're trying to rehabilitate. Uh, and the list goes on and on. And these programs are ongoing. They're active. Uh, we also have a lot of our researchers and scientists constantly giving updates to us so we can post those updates on ongoing blogs and, and uh, video logs. And also, um, you know, right in the palm of your hand, if you have a, a smartphone, <clears throat> our Twitter feed, San Diego Zoo, and also our Facebook page, San Diego Zoo. And then from there, you can find the Safari Park and also our conservation pages, too, to get ongoing, very updated, always on top of things. And if you have questions, you can always post them there, and, and we'll, we'll respond with our mediators. So it's, a, it's a, like I said, it's ongoing, always very active. Uh, your listeners can definitely check out those websites, Facebook pages, and Twitter for a lot more information. Thank you very much for this report about the San Diego Zoo. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for having us. Be sure to share Jungle Deep Podcast with your friends and co-workers. The show is my creation and at my personal expense. It is not currently subsidized by any business or organization. Audience growth is especially important for Jungle Deep to succeed and prosper. So share the show. You can see beautiful photos and learn more about Jungle Deep at our website, calaverasgold.tv. Now that's Spanish, calaveras, C-A-L-A-V-E-R-A-S, gold, G-O-L-D, like the mineral, dot TV, like television. You gotta check it out. Where else can you go for this kind of fun? Just click on the Jungle Deep title in the header directory. Our show notes pages have valuable links for you. I invite you to email me at jungledeep at calaverasgold.tv and follow me on Twitter. Search for Jungle Deep or Ken Jones 56 all one word. I would love to hear your ideas for the show. Well, the show's over for today, so it's time to refill my Mai Tai, mount my elephant, and head back into the jungle. <laughs>